Unusual History Part 2. These smaller groups of white humans were each placed to live with and among the other three races. And just as Inky had envisioned, the white humans did whatever they had to do so they would find themselves in a position of authority. It didn't take long, and with the help of the white humans, the mining operations to amass monodomic gold were finally underway. Turning his attention back to the humans, it quickly became clear to Inky there was no way to actually detect the soul while it was inside the body of the human beings. It frustrated Dinky to no end. He had gone so far as to take 13 human wives and father a large amount of children, half human, half Anunnaki. His intention was that if he could not achieve immortality, he could produce children that could. However, it was this phase of experimentation that nearly took Kinky from the grips of sanity to an obsessed maniac. There was no way to know if his experiments worked. The soul was no more detectable in his children than in humans. Whether he had been successful or not, Enki would never know. It was at this time Enki made his most crucial discovery. By chance, he stumbled across some undiscovered information stolen from Eden. Vital information about the soul. He learned the soul was, in fact, a tangible item. It could only be detected and seen after the death of the human host. It appeared then as it traversed the universe on the trip back to Eden. It became vulnerable in the form of light. It didn't take Inky long to create a plan to confuse, distract, manipulate and erase any lingering recognition of their soul and its purpose. Inky didn't want the knowledge of who they were why they were on earth, and what the purpose of the soul was, creeping back into the minds of men. He would give them a new and totally different understanding to live by. It was the act of leaving the one, which number two had done in the early years of creation, that gave all creatures something called free will. Free will would, in the eyes of Venki, become the most favorable of gifts bestowed on creation by what had become known as the Six-Headed Beast. And Inky was prepared to take full advantage of his creator's many gifts if it meant immortality. The children of Inky were a powerful group. They had no soul, but they did have some of the strengths that made Inky such a powerful creature. One such quality they acquired was a lifespan much greater than a human. On average, these children would roam the earth for up to 5,000 years. Another was their size and strength. The males in particular reached heights of 10 feet, weighed nearly 800 pounds and had the strength of 10 men. The reaction of the population towards these massive creatures, who otherwise resembled humans, is what gave Venki the idea which ultimately resulted in our current state of world affairs today. Inki had his children roam the earth in search of the worst human beings alive. It was now apparent just how wrong some of Inki's experiments had gone. Murderers, rapists, thieves, and tyrants made up a decent part of the population. When they found these offenders, they made an example out of them and slaughtered them all. The children of Inky told the remaining humans the type of behavior these bad humans displayed was against what they were willing to accept as allowable from this point on. The children of Inky claimed their role as gods amongst men. They presented their absent father as the one, creator of heaven and earth, and promised anyone who crossed them or their father would meet the same fate as the many men they had recently slaughtered. 
The humans began to cower in fear at the sight of these massive half-humans. And they would go to any length to secure the favor of these gods if they could. The reason Enki was going to such great lengths to deceive the humans should be of great concern to every human alive today. Enki had been successful in his attempts to capture a human soul as it ascended to Eden. He formed the grid over the planet. What he learned from this was, and still is, a very frightening prospect which affects us as human beings to this very day. Enki had found a way to harness, drain, and absorb the unique type of energy the human soul contained into his own system. And by doing so, Enki had secured the lesser version of the immortality he had sacrificed so much of his sanity to while searching for the secrets to living forever. All he needed was an endless supply of human souls to drain and absorb, to consume. For as long as he can secure a steady supply of human souls, ENKI will not die as long as the elite control the system. In their true form, the Anunnaki were not small creatures. Enki was a foot taller and 100 pounds heavier than the largest and most powerful of his children, Zeus. In his full Anunnaki dress uniform and in his true physical form, Enki presented himself to the occupants of Earth. The weapons of mass destruction Enki possessed gave credence to the claim he made to the population in each location he appeared as he demonstrated his powers for emphasis. Region by region Enki visited all the occupied territories around the world in support of what his children had recently established. The world's very first religion. Enki was determined to be their god their creator and judge and ruler of all. The concept took its place immediately in the minds of the population of Earth. To disrespect the one or his many children meant certain doom. But serving them with your life and living to please the one meant great rewards here on Earth and also in the afterlife. Enki painted a beautiful picture to the humans of eternal life with him. He explained the nature of the human soul and how it was a part of the human experience that could live forever as a guest in his kingdom. Next, he explained the nature of free will. To gain entry to his kingdom which is called heaven, a conscious desire had to be spoken aloud expressing a request to exist in heaven with the one. The humans were made to drop to their knees in front of Enki and pledge on their life to abide by the rules he had created for them to live by. And so it began. And for the next 4,000 years, Enki and his children solidified their strong hold on the human race. Like their father, the children of Enki took human lovers. By the time the first of Enki's children had grown old and died, Enki's family had grown to be enormous. By the fifth generation of breeding with humans, Enki's grandchildren had taken on the human form and were indistinguishable from the actual humans. Under Enki's guidance, his grandchildren would tighten the hold on humans by introducing governments and the church to all of mankind, each with its own design to control how the humans lived their lives. The world was separated into manageable sized sections called countries. Borders were drawn, and several kingdoms established within each country. The most influential of Enki's extended family were put in positions of power to rule over the entirety of each country. A hierarchy of control over all the humans was put in place. All to secure Enki's place at the top of it all. 
the one. And to this day, though we don't realize or accept it, the descendants of Enki's children continue to hold control of the world. And they still have no souls. As observant, intelligent, and cautious as Enki was, it turned out he wasn't quite as secretive as he thought himself to be. An other member of the Anunnaki had discovered why Inki had gone to such extremes creating this elaborate system of control over the humans. Mordek was an outcast, and he hated this planet. He was looking for a way to seek revenge on the human race. Like most deviant minds, he blamed all things, except himself, for all of his problems. When Mordek discovered the secret Tenki was keeping, he documented everything, including how Enki was taking credit for all creation and falsely claiming to be the one. Mordek used the evidence he had gathered to blackmail Lenki into providing him access to the technology so he could consume souls and become immortal as well. As miserable, angry, and pissed off at the world as Mordek was, there was no surprise in way he chose to win possession of the souls. He played on the worst of the human traits that had developed in the unfortunate victims of Inky's obsession with genetic manipulation. Traits like greed, anger, jealousy, and corruption were Mordek's signature approach. He would provide material riches such as money, gold, precious gems, and even sultry women, and offer them a life of gluttony, control, and power to turn people away from Enki's promise of eternal life in heaven. Mordek painted his own picture of an awesome place to spend eternity, which also would attract its fair share of humans. Like Enki, Mordek had succumbed to the beauty held by the women of Earth. He too had a large family of part human, Pardon new naked children and grandchildren. He brought them all together. But rather than operate like Inki and create an opposing faction of towns and cities of their own, Mordek decided his approach would consist of infiltrating and corrupting the system of control Linky had established from the inside out. In response, Sinki had the church chat a story that told of a fate worse than death for those who would take up sides with Mordek. To join with Mordek meant your soul would burn and be tortured forever in a truly evil, sick place called hell. And just as this battle for human souls really got going in full swing, it came to a sudden stop. In a stunning display of Creator's intense capability, the One appeared suddenly out of thin air. In the next instance, whooping from the sky came a small fleet of spacecraft which landed very close to where the One now stood. From inside these crafts, a group of representatives from Eden stepped foot on the soil of Earth for the first time in hundreds of thousands of years. Sadness turned quickly to anger as what they saw around them sunk in. They wanted their planet back. But with something as complicated as the one mediating the situation, it would not be as simple as forcing the Anunnaki out. The one saw opportunity for a test of strength between the soulless creation of the six-headed beast and his very own creation, the residents of Eden. It was the humans the One wanted put to the test. Creator had approved the original design of human beings, but now had some serious doubt about the integrity of this mutated creature that was really nothing like it had started out to be. There were great concerns about gifting immortality to such an unstable life form the human eye had changed, thus it now has to prove itself. So, to ensure these humans were put to the test, 
The one decided that the Anunnaki would no longer be allowed to reveal themselves in the flesh to humans. Both Thinky and Mordok would have to go into permanent hiding or leave Earth. It was up to them. The residents of Eden were given the same restrictions. They were not permitted to show themselves to the residents of Earth. They had to find a way for the humans to see what was happening and what had happened in the past for the world to end up going from what it was to what it is now, today here. Enki was quick to approach Mordek. With all that was at stake, the two opposing Anunnaki warriors decided to join forces and unite their families who were permitted to stay on Earth. They had no souls so were of no interest to the one. At this point, Mordok went into hiding. Enki, on the other hand, used his ability to shapeshift one last time as he too disappeared from the face of the earth never to be seen in his true form again. Inki transformed himself into a fertilized embryo in the womb of a descendant of his own family, a young woman named Mary. Nine months later, Inki was born into the world as a human baby. A baby with no soul of its own. A baby named Jesus. A baby that would forever enslave mankind and provide himself, and more to an everlasting supply of souls. At least that was the plan the two Anunnaki had come up with after being confronted by the One. The centurions from Eden were a smart bunch. But this type of mental warfare was not their strong suit. The Anunnaki had the advantage since deceit seemed to be the spirit of this contest. They were not without some tricks of their own, however. The residents of Eden had already captured several humans and began the complicated process of reversing the genetic manipulations that Inki had performed. It turned out to be impossible. Much of what Inky had done was now a permanent part of human life regardless. They had a plan B and once more the humans were subjected to further genetic modifications. It was a tricky process. The human host had to physically die. Then their soul was captured and manipulated. A jolt of electricity was then used to bring the human back to life. And that was it. The altered soul returned to the body. The body released back to where it was taken from, unharmed. This method wasn't the quick fix needed, but in the long run, it would be more effective. This addition to the soul didn't change the person who received the upgrade. It was designed to create change in the offspring of the recipients. It was a process that would take a very long time, but it would eventually produce some very different humans. They would look the same as everyone else, but their hearts and minds would be far more in tune with the needs of Mother Earth and her occupants. Their empathetic values would outshine common man. And in the early part of the 1900s, the very first indigo soul arrived on Earth a quirky Australian man named Daryl Flynn. The long-awaited results started to trickle in until the late 1960s when the first main wave is of indigo souls were born into this world. And every year since, I'm sure as indigo souls matured and began having children of their own, the crystal children began to rise. The crystal children are to be the witnesses to a great global change. It's their duty and role to document what takes place. They will use the knowledge of their journey to create a better way of life for the future offspring. Never again will people suffer the fate the human population has endured so far at the hands of Enki and Morda. 
The union between the children of Enki and Mordok was very powerful and very corrupt. For almost 2,000 years, they have worked hand in hand to ensure the secrets and lies of the past stay buried. The church knows all the lies. It's their role to protect Mordek and Enki and keep them alive by ensuring a steady stream of our souls to arrive to be consumed. It was also a key component of the plan to ensure that the world never finds out how two Anunnaki madmen fooled the world with the story about Jesus and Lucifer to enslave the world. If you haven't caught on, there is only one way to win back the Garden of Eden. Enki and Mordek have exceeded their lifespan and are vulnerable to our unconditional love. The source of their immortality, our souls, is all that is keeping them alive. Our recent surge in spirituality and atheism has weakened them. The Pope is above all current leaders on the planet. He commands the legion of soulless tyrants who have taken over the world to attack us. They have crafted a web of deceit and corruption in the never-ending lust for power and control of the entire planet just to capture souls for the two gods. And in doing so, they have enslaved us all with war and a list of unspeakable controls to scramble our gut intuition. We are bound to them by something called the monetary system, via many avenues Big Pharma, taxation, war, healthcare, blah, blah. Value is placed on a worthless object, a simple piece of paper, for example. That object is then provided in great quantity to most anyone with the ability to repay what was borrowed by charging a substantial fee for such a loan. These tyrants in control of the monetary system are making a huge profit at our expense for doing absolutely nothing. They have found a way to control every aspect of our lives. They control food production and distribution health care, space programs, knowledge consumption, they control energy production and distribution. They control access to water, healthcare, education, and a whole long list of other essential services. And they have introduced a massive array of distractions which draw our attention away from everything they do. TV being one of the most potent distractions of them all in war as the number one large bargaining chip. These distractions serve to create an atmosphere of confusion about and detachment from the present moment we all share. In case it may have slipped past you, the present moment is all we have it is the concrete of creation. Though their system of timekeeping lends a hand to distract you from the fact that time doesn't exist, it is always right now. Right now is the time to face these liars. Right now is the time to walk away from their churches, their banks, their corporations that monopolize the food industry and their set of principles which guide our entire lives. Right now it's time to end this nightmare of illusion and deceit. If we choose not to act against these tyrants soon, our fate will be sealed for another 1,000 years, a 100 million years, before anyone with the courage to lead this reclamation of planet Earth will rise again. We are here just as David has sworn to give his life as many have to prove all we say is real. How many nightmares or gallons of bloodshed will it take to prove simple proofs to be seen? Please understand our lives are delivered to earth to free yours. Part 2 ends here. See you soon on the next episode.